Michael Swickert here. Welcome to Enchanting Stories of New Mexico, sponsored by the Fresh Chili Company in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Our award-winning Hatch Green and Red Chili is brought to you from locally owned farms in Hatch, New Mexico, the chili capital of the world. The Fresh Chili Company podcast is looking for podcast podness. To be a podcast partner, just share however you're listening pass these stories on to your friends and families. You'll be one of our podnas. A little history of New Mexico. The U.S. Territorial New Mexico Census in 1850 found that 61,547 people lived in all of the territory of New Mexico. Now, you and I think of New Mexico as being beside Texas, Mexico, Colorado, Oklahoma, Utah, and, and, and Arizona, right? That's how it is now. Uh, Back then, in that era, New Mexico bordered Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Utah, and California. New Mexico was on the border of California. Yep, I skipped Arizona because all the land in today's New Mexico and Arizona was only New Mexico territory back then. When the territory of New Mexico was created as a U.S. territory in 1850, the entire area was called New Mexico. It was administered from Santa Fe. Then with the start of the Civil War, the Confederates decided to divide New Mexico into half, and on the western half they called it the Territory of Arizona. A Civil War battle was fought. It was the furthest westward battle in the Civil War, it was 1862 Battle of Picacho Peak, or Picacho Pass. Nope, not the Las Cruces, New Mexico, Picacho Peak. This peak was about 50 miles northwest of Tucson. It's kind of a small engagement with uh, several dozen soldiers. A couple were killed. A large group of Union sympathizers, about 1,500 in number, were coming from California. That We call them the California Column. They were led by General James Henry Carlton. Uh, they ran the Confederates out of Arizona and southern New Mexico. Many members of the California Column have descendants living in the Mesilla Valley. I've spoken to one of them in the last two weeks. I'll talk about the California Column and its effect upon New Mexico in another podcast. In February of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill establishing the territory of Arizona out of the western half of New Mexico. So the census in 1850 and 1860 was for both states as just New Mexico. Now, gold and silver had been found in both Arizona and New Mexico in a, a, around 1860, which sparked a flood of get-rich miners to both areas. Arizona's first official territorial capital was Prescott, Arizona. This was in 1864. Now, Prescott, a little trivia here, was first known as Fort Wiffle. (laughs) So a lot of people think the first capital of Arizona was Fort Wiffle, but they had changed the name to Prescott. There was an intense gold rush in that central part of Arizona, so the capital was moved to Tucson and then finally to Phoenix, where it is today. Let me tell you some good culinary news. The 2023 Hatch Chili Pepper growing season is in harvest. Therefore, the chili roasting drums are fired up with that wonderful sound and smell. Remember, that's the official aroma of New Mexico, the smell of roasting Hatch green chili. Fire roasting gives the chili a wonderful smoky flavor and helps remove the waxy skin. Michael Swickert here with Enchanting Stories of New Mexico, sponsored by the Fresh Chili Company. Hit subscribe to automatically get these podcasts and be a Fresh Chili Company podcast podna by hitting share and letting your friends and family hear these stories. Thank you very much. Now, fishing is good in New Mexico. Some lakes and streams are what are called special trout water, which sometimes called quality waters. 
For most, only artificial flies and lures with a single barbless hook can be used. All have bag and possession restrictions. Out-of-state anglers must purchase an annual fishing license, a one-day fishing license, or a five-day fishing license. The fishing license year is April 1st to March 31st the next year. A fishing license is not required for 18-year-olds and younger. You can get the fishing licenses online at the New Mexico Game and Fish website. 70 years of age and older, guess what? Like me, your fishing license is free. Now, this is important. If you have fish for dinner, something you caught, you use the Fresh Chili Company products to enhance it, take a picture and post it and the recipe on the Fresh Chili Company Facebook page. You can be famous. More history. General Lew Wallace was appointed at this time in 1850 to be the territorial governor of New Mexico a job he found difficult at best. History m remembers him as not doing very well in the Civil War Battle of Shiloh. But in 1850, besides becoming the territorial governor of New Mexico, which was a state in crisis because of the lawlessness of the Lincoln County Wars and more, he was also a best-selling author with his book, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. Fast forward 78 years, and it was made into an Oscar-winning movie. He had passed, so he never did get to see the, the movie. Now, here's some trivia. The opening scene with the chariots racing required 15,000 extras on the set outside of Rome. It was an 18-acre set. That riveting scene, which was over in just a couple minutes, took five weeks to film. But there's... Something more important about Lou Wallace and the points he was making. He wrote the best description of New Mexico, according to many people, and including myself, when he wrote, here, here's what he wrote, all calculations based on our experiences elsewhere fail in New Mexico. I love that. All calculations based on our experiences elsewhere fail in New Mexico. Lou Wallace spent two and a half years being frustrated at how things worked and more precisely how things didn't work in New Mexico. Now fast forward to World War II and New Mexico. Several units of the New Mexico National Guard were in the Philippines when the war broke out and they became prisoners of war for the duration and were many of them were included in the Bataan Death March. For its population, the state of New Mexico lost more servicemen than any other state. New Mexico, because of its wide open spaces and mild climate, was also a place where bomber pilots and bombardiers were trained, some of them in the Carlsbad area and some in the Alamogordo area that would extend clear over to Deming. Uh, that, was, that was B-24 training over by Alamogordo. Now, North Africa, the first place these bombers were to be stationed, was very much like New Mexico in its climate, so this was good. Now, originally, the Tularosa Basin ranchers were to be displaced for maybe a couple years. But there was an unforeseen complication. People ask about this. All over what is now federal restricted White Sands Missile Range land is unexploded ordnance from many sources. And again, that goes back 70 years. There have been attempts to re return some of that land to private use, but there's a danger of unexploded uh, shells, and that has canceled that idea. There's been some soldiers and technicians on the White Sands Missile Range who actually were killed or injured when these mysterious danger of unexploded ordnance came up. Working the range, those people have been schooled on being very careful when you step off one of the roads. My uncle, Eugene McKim, was a radar expert for civil service, worked at the range for 42 years. He drove all over that range, and he mentioned the danger several times, but he himself was never injured. More history. Did you know that in 1898, Thomas Edison, you know, the inventor of the light bulb and much more, came to New Mexico to do something that most people said was impossible. He was intending to invent something for the Galisteo Company. That, that was a mining company in northern New Mexico. 
What they wanted to do was to mine certain minerals without using precious water. Water is always precious in New Mexico. Edison designed a milk for this purpose and personally came out to guide the construction and then the use of the milling process that wasn't going to use water. The net proceeds of the mill was supposed to be one-third to Thomas Edison and two-thirds to the Galisteo Company. Unfortunately, you knew there was going to be an unfortunately, the theoretical process that Thomas Edison designed did not work. He said shotguns and he left without making any money. He had several quotes on that process. He said, I have not failed 700 times. I have not failed once. I have succeeded in proving that those 700 ways will not work. When I have eliminated the ways that will not work, I will find a way that will work. Well, he never did. Thomas Edison. Speaking of New Mexico counties tied to history, there are some 33 counties tied to a number of uh, counties we have in New Mexico. Some of them are tied to national politics, such as Lincoln County, President Abraham Lincoln, Roosevelt County, President Teddy Roosevelt, Harding County, President Warren G. Harding, McKinley County, that was President William McKinley, and last but not least, Grant County, President Ulysses S. Grant. Now, here's the interesting thing. Did you know that Grant County has a connection to Colfax County? Do you see the connection, Grant, to Colfax? Well, here it is. Schuler Colfax did not invent the fax machine, even though his name was Colfax. He was President Ulysses Grant's vice president. And Colfax County, Raton is the, on the border of Colorado is the county seat. That, that then, so you have both the vice president and the president named for New Mexico counties here. Grant County on the lower end of New Mexico has 28,185 residents, whereas Colfax County only has 12,000 some odd. I was a U.S. Census Bureau supervisor in the last census and spent some time in the Silver City area out in the hinterlands working with ranches, doing the census on ranches. I really enjoyed that. And so you got Harding County. People know the name. That whole county in the census only had 667 residents, the smallest one in New Mexico. Roosevelt County with Portales had 19,000. Lincoln County, 20,000. I worked all over Lincoln County for much of the last census. And what is the largest? McKinley County with 72,000. One thing's for sure, all chili peppers are not the same. Some have more or less taste heat than others. Some taste a bit more sweet. Well, now the same is true with onions. I bet you haven't thought about onions that much. The New Mexico State University is one of two universities that really researches the different varieties and does onion breeding. They do so for taste, ability to resist onion diseases, and all the stuff that's tied to growing and harvesting the onions. So there is a term that's used, sweet onions. Those are the onions that are not as pungent, not as strong as other onions. Here in our area and for sale at the Fresh Chili Company are sweet onions that are used uh, in the development of chili and onion sauces. Have I tried the combination? Oh, yes, and it is ever so great when I put it on mashed potatoes and also on steaks that I'm grilling. Other uses of onions, I haven't got there yet, but I will. About 10% of the onions grown in our area, 10% are sweet onions, meaning they're not quite as strong, which some people like, which some people like me like. New Mex Sweet is the holding name for several of these varieties of onions. They have high productivity, low pungency, and they are disease tolerant as compared to other onions. New Mexico State researchers have been working on onions back to the days of Fabian Garcia in the 1920s. He started many of the programs for chili peppers, pecans, and onions, and also some other stuff. There are many competitors to sweet onions, and the onions here are constantly being evaluated and adjusted to make them the best for consumers and the best for commercial operations. Again, the Fresh Chili Company have the New Mex Fresh Sweet Onions for sale for a little while. It's kind of a short season, but we do have them right now. Michael Swickert here with Enchanting Stories of New Mexico. 
uh, the chili ha- uh, ha- the harvest is going on. Big Jim is a very popular, popular uh, chili. Well, they're going to have the Big Jim Veritol in a 16-ounce jar. Veritol means that this product is only made with Big Jim chili, which is sweet, and uh, I happen to like it a lot. It was developed by Chile researcher Dr. Roy Nakayama at New Mexico State University, a hybrid of New Mexico chili peppers and a Peruvian pepper. Nakayama and fellow researcher Jim Lytle combined. Big Jim is named for Jim Lytle, who died unexpectedly at that time. I, I talked about Dr. Roy Nakayama on last Wednesday's podcast, if you want to learn something about him. And so... Uh, it's a it's a good thing to know about Dr. Roy Nakayama. Now, one thing that happens when people live in New Mexico or live in Las Cruces, they happen to be in our little slice of paradise. They can come by the Fresh Chili Company gift shop at 1160 El Paseo Road, Suite D7A. It's open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's a lot of products you may want to look at. A local honey with hatch red chili that is, I have to tell you, great on biscuits. French fries are ever so much better with the Fresh Chili Company's Hatchup, which is some ketchup and hatch red chili. Come browse and take a look what we have. That's the Fresh Chili Company Gift Shop, 1160 El Paseo Road, Suite D7A in Las Cruces, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and that is Monday through Saturday. This is Michael Swickert with Enchanting Stories of New Mexico, brought to you by the Fresh Chili Company. Thank you for your time today. We'll always have news and stories about New Mexico on these podcasts, and uh, we appreciate if you share them with your friends. That would be just wonderful. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, yes, and eat plenty of that good Hatch Valley chili. Like I always say, some chili's good, more is better. Bye for now.